Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. A few weeks ago, the official position of the Obama administration was that it would be an unlikely event that someone with Ebola does reach our shores. Well, as we now know, someone with Ebola did reach our shores. We were also assured that if it happened, American authorities were instituting new measures so that we're prepared. Then the unlikely event happened. Yet again last week, Dr. Craig Spencer, who had been treating Ebola patients in Guinea with Doctors Without Borders, was diagnosed with the disease after his return to New York. And now we learn that the promise of new measures so that we're prepared did not really prepare us at all. Though they have been successfully treated, two of America's most recent victims caught the disease in U.S. hospitals. Government officials continue to tell us not to worry, but things continue to go in ways that confound their predictions. They tell us it's very difficult to catch the disease, but send teams in full hazmat gear to the apartments of those who have had it. They burn every stick of furniture, every article of clothing, every personal belonging. They say you should stay at least three feet away from Ebola patients, but preferably six feet. And then they say that it's no big deal to ride on a crowded subway jammed in with possible infected persons. I still don't expect Ebola to be a critical problem in the United States, but I'm concerned that the government's confusing signals indicate widespread chaos in the ranks. However, there's another contagion that bothers me even more than Ebola. It's sweeping across North America, and it's far more dangerous than Ebola. I'm talking about the contagion of radical Islam. On October 20th, Martin Couture Rollo mowed down two Canadian soldiers with his car. The recent convert to Islam then led police on a high-speed chase during which he actually called 911 and boasted that he was acting in the name of Allah. One of the soldiers he struck, Warren Officer Patrice Vincent, died. The other is still recovering. Two days later, on October 22nd, Michael Zahav Bibo, whose birth name is Michael Hall, fatally shot Corporal Nathan Cirillo. Corporal Cirillo was a Canadian soldier standing ceremonial guard at the Canadian National War Memorial. That's the equivalent of the U.S. tomb of the unknown soldier. Cirillo's ceremonial rifle was not even loaded the assailant then raced over to the Canadian Parliament building itself. Once inside, he sprayed the corridors with gunfire before being shot and killed by the sergeant at arms. Once again, the perpetrator had recently converted to Islam. In New York City, the next day, October 23rd, Zale Thompson, another recent Muslim convert, used a hatchet to attack three police officers who were posing for a picture. One of them, Officer Kenneth Healy, remains in critical condition at the time of this taping, suffering from a hatchet wound to the head. In Denver, Colorado, three girls ages 15, 16, and 17, and two of them sisters, didn't show up for school. On a hunch, the father of one checked to see if his daughter's passport was missing. It was. He went to the father of the other two girls. Their passports were also gone, along with $2,000 in cash. They called the FBI, which flagged their passports. The girls had already reached Germany when officials there finally stopped them and returned them to the United States. They were on their way to Syria to join the Islamic Jihad. A month earlier, 19-year-old Shannon Conley, also of Colorado, pled guilty to charges of conspiring to help terrorists in Syria. 
These people are the tip of the very big iceberg floating in North American waters. The fall issue of the Al-Qaeda magazine, Resurgence, begins with an editorial on the lasting impact of 9-11. It says, Western leaders and intellectuals obsessed with reforming Islam, building moderate Muslim networks, and drying the swamps that sustain jihad are having a hard time getting their heads around the revival of Islam. The superficial intellectualism instilled in Western universities will always prove inadequate to comprehend the extraordinary resilience of a faith that flourishes in the face of adversity. In some ways, they're right. Western leaders think that they can reform Islam. They think that sage pronouncements on the true meaning of Islam from non-Muslim American politicians will straighten these people out. It's ridiculous. They mistakenly think they can build moderate Muslim networks. In Syria, for instance, because they really can't get their heads around the revival of Islam. And when Al-Qaeda says revival, it means a return to 7th century Islam full of grotesque violence, beheadings, tortures, rapes, murders of all kinds, the subjugation of women, and the destruction of even the most basic human rights. Their belief in the literal Quran provides moral cover for wars of conquest accompanied by the most violent acts of barbarism. Therefore, they're happy to violate universally accepted standards of right and wrong, the ones God placed in human hearts from the beginning, the ones we all know about, even those who refuse to acknowledge their source. The magazine is also correct to say, the superficial intellectualism instilled in Western universities will always prove inadequate to comprehend the extraordinary resilience of Islam. When it comes to real Islam, Western universities don't have a clue. Under certain circumstances, radical Islam is highly contagious. It spreads person to person, Facebook follower to Facebook follower. It's overwhelmingly attractive to those who love violence, and that increasingly describes our culture. Have you seen any popular video games lately? Today's culture not only teaches violence, it exalts it as a human ideal and as great fun. From the early days of the World Wide Web, Muslims have used love of violence to recruit angry young men. One of their big selling points has always been to compare that aspect of Islam with the peacefulness of Christianity. Jesus said to turn the other cheek, and they proudly tell potential recruits that they do not believe in turning the other cheek. They believe in full bore retribution for every slight. Just take a look at these demonstrations in London or Paris. The number of North Americans infected with the contagion of jihad remains small so far, but a few can do great harm if they're fully committed to killing, stealing, and destroying. Some members of the media and government have tried to tell us that the terrorist events in Canada and the United States last week were not important because a they were lone wolf attacks, not coordinated by any terrorist organization, and B, the assailants had been in trouble with the law before converting to Islam. But the fact that they seem to have been lone wolf attacks only confirms the size of the challenge. These are not card-carrying members of a terror group. It's more subversive than that. They carry jihad in their heads and hearts, until they're ready to unleash it on the world. As to being in trouble with the law before conversion, that's by design. The radical Muslims actively recruit people whose lives seem hopeless. Even though their numbers here are presently small, they're growing and may be, may be on the verge of an explosion in growth. Like any contagion, radical Islam spreads most easily where the people have no immunity to the disease. And in America, 
that immunity is day by day being systematically destroyed. It's been a kind of chemotherapy. Those trying to rid society of the restraints of Christianity have made their young increasingly vulnerable to the message of violent jihad. When I return, I'll show you how the message of jihad is being preached in Ferguson, Missouri. In its highest form, the civil rights movement in the United States has been nonviolent. In his acceptance of the Nobel Peace Prize, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon. Indeed, it is a weapon unique in history, which cuts without wounding and ennobles the man who wields it. There were those who disagree with him, people who actually wanted a race war. But King knew that by remaining peaceful in the face of aggression, his movement would hold the moral high ground. The movement he led largely disappeared because of his own success. Still, racial divisions and tensions remain. They showed themselves again starting on August 9th in Ferguson, Missouri, a town of just 21,000 in the greater St. Louis area. On that day, a white police officer, Darren Wilson, shot and killed Michael Brown, an 18-year-old African-American. Until now, I've chosen not to speak about Ferguson because even after countless hours of television coverage, we really don't know the full story. The information we have comes mostly from conflicting eyewitness testimony and a series of leaks from anonymous sources. Some say that uh, Michael Brown had surrendered and had his hands in the air when Officer Wilson shot him. On the other hand, the leaked forensic evidence indicates that Brown attacked Officer Wilson first in his car, then out of it, and the policeman shot him in self-defense. Those who accuse the officer of shooting Michael Brown in cold blood are outraged that there has been no indictment. It is in their frustration and pain that this story takes a huge and bizarre turn. As the anti-police protests have continued, anti-Israel organizations of all stripes have converged on Ferguson in an attempt to reach disaffected Americans with their anti-Semitic pro-Muslim message. On October 3rd, Breitbart News reported Pro-Palestinian and other Muslim activist groups are a growing presence in the protests. Several protest groups have joined together calling themselves the Palestinian Contingent. They put out this statement. Local groups, including the Organization for Black Struggle and the St. Louis Palestine Solidarity Committee, are inviting those who support the Palestinian struggle for liberation to stand in solidarity with the people of Ferguson. On the weekend of October 10th through the 13th, a series of meetings called Weekend of Resistance was held in Ferguson, attracting activists from all over the country. Scheduled speakers, including Faison Syed, representing CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, it has its roots in the Muslim Brotherhood and is anti-Israel to the core. Pro-Palestinian activists Muhammad Malik and Rama Kodami of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation were also listed as speakers. Most of the events were held at the Dar al-Jalal Islamic Center and Mosque in nearby Hazelwood, Missouri. They promised that on the following Monday, they would push for action focused on a target highlighting intersections of militarized policing in Ferguson and Palestine. The Palestinian contingent included 